Hello everyone. In this episode, I hope to answer the question, what is green chemistry? Have you ever thought that before? They, these phrases almost become like corporate buzzwords. You hear them everywhere and you're like, practically speaking, what does this really mean? What are you talking about? Well, I hope to answer that question in this episode. And I hope these guys are gonna give us a little bit of a clue. When I first started teaching, I started seriously considering what does green chemistry mean? And I started out very cynical uh, and I really believed it was more of just a corporate buzzword that didn't mean anything that they said to make themselves look better. And uh, I, started, I started to change my opinion in that I just wanted to give it a chance and kind of see if maybe this could actually be a good thing and if it was practical. That's what we're gonna talk about is practically speaking, what is green chemistry? I didn't find the answer to my liking right away, but eventually I would find a couple of chapters in a book called Caveman Chemistry by Kevin Dunn that I really thought illustrated green chemistry. Uh, and I thought it was just a, a great story. So as we start our story, first I would like to ask you, do you like glass? Glass in your homes, it lets natural light in. How about paper? Paper, you can read books. It used to be the way we uh, read books before the internet. Um, what about soap, right? All of these products were starting to become more and more available in the uh, late 1700s. So this is the late 18th century. Uh, and this is undoubtedly raising the standard of living. So uh, glass is important, right? Let's natural light in. That's good for us, just for us to have natural light in. Um, soap. Soap was, I mean, they're getting close to the heyday of public health initiatives and soap was a big part of that. Uh, so all of these are raising the standard of living, they're, they're good, they're positive things, but there started to be some problems. So that's where our story is gonna focus on. Uh, and to start that story, we're gonna go to France. Sacre bleu, France had a problem. Uh, in order to make these products that were helping middle and lower classes to, to raise their standard of living, um, we needed some critical chemical precursors. These were called alkalis. Now you may have heard the expression acids and bases. Alkalis are a base. Bases are kind of like the flip side of the coin of acids. You know, not exactly, but you can think of it that way. And um, France did not have a good internal source for these alkalis. There were two main alkalis being used, soda ash and potash. All right, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce potash. It's either potash or potash. Uh, I should look this up one of these days. Uh, so back to the story. France did not have a good internal source for these. Uh, the French Academy of Sciences recognized this as a problem and offered an award for somebody who could come up with a process to develop, to generate alkalis using internally sourced materials. If you want to understand why this could be a problem, think you know, they're going to have to continually, you know, uh, pay out money out of the country in a way, right? It's going somewhere else. Uh, so that might be a problem for you, right? You could think that'd be a problem for them. Uh, but also there tended to be friction between these European countries. What if they had uh, some friction and then, you know, Spain had a good source of alkalis. What if Spain just cut off the source of alkalis to them? They literally would be in a situation where they could not produce these goods at all. So not a good situation for France. So the French Academy steps in and offers an award for somebody to come up with an alternative process. Now this is really kind of like a human ingenuity thing, right? Look for an alternative way, except this human ingenuity is starting to take on more of a sciency feel. So people realize, hey, these elements are kind of the same as these elements. Well, maybe we can just kind of do a process to turn these into something that we want over here. All right. So, Science is learning more atomic theories around this time. Uh, you know, the, the methods, the procedures are getting better. Experiments are getting better. Equipment's getting better. People are able to do this stuff now. So the French Academy offers this award and a man named Nicolas LeBlanc would win this award. He figured out a way to do this. He figured out a process that only needed uh, coal, salt, uh, Glauber salt, uh, which is actually made from sulfuric acid and salt uh, and uh, limestone, all of which France had local sources. If you're thinking about the names of these alkalis and you're thinking soda ash uh, and you're wondering, does that have something to do with soda? Well, 
Soda ash is sodium carbonate. You can see carbonate, carbonated beverages. There is actually something there. Potash is potassium carbonate. Potash is named after the process used to get it. So I like how they give these things, um, you know, sort of homey, clever names. Uh, potash, you can take certain plants and burn them. Then you take the ashes that are left over and put them in water. Whatever doesn't dissolve in the water, you can just sort of scrape off and uh, disregard that. Whatever is in the water is trapped in there now. So we need some way to get it out. Well, what if we boiled it all off, the water that is, in a big pot? Then whatever's left over in there is the potash. The potash, uh, like I said, is potassium carbonate. So uh, if you think about that process, you can understand how Spain and England were making soda ash in this case, but it's a similar process. So Spain had something called salt wort. Salt wort was 20% soda ash. Fantastic. That's actually pretty good. Uh, the alternative was to use kelp. So Ireland and Scotland were finding kelp. You know, you just go get it out of the ocean, whatever, burn it, and it gets around, they would get around 6% soda ash. So the process that uh, Ireland and Scotland are using takes over three times the effort to get the same amount of uh, soda ash as Spain with its source of with its salt wort. Not a particularly good situation, but England seemed to be happy with it. France, not so much. So the French Academy offers this award. Nicolas LeBlanc wins. Score, France can now produce alkalis. Uh, and Nicolas LeBlanc is given a factory. He starts production. Everything's looking up for him, right? Well, at this point, we have a little bit of a wrinkle in the story. If you know the time and you know your history, the 1790s, right around there, is the French Revolution. So French society is thrown into chaos in a way. A lot of people are getting their heads chopped off. Uh, Nicolas LeBlanc, although he's not beheaded, he does have his factory taken away. And in all the chaos, he loses his patent. The patent is just gone. So when all of the dust settles, he eventually is re-gifted the factory and allowed to restart production. But the genie was out of the bottle. Other companies knew how to make it and he had lost the, uh, the advantage of a head start. So he was never actually able to make this work uh, and he would end up shooting himself in 1806. Kind of sad, huh? Um, anyway, everybody still realized it was a good business to be in to make alkalis. And so the LeBlanc process would take off. It just exploded. And by the mid part of the next century, you have 150,000 tons per year being produced, mostly in England. So England, remember they had a sort of good way of generating alkalis, but they really jumped on this process. And maybe that was kind of a good thing for the French people. I don't know, we'll see, uh, you decide. Uh, so they're generating 150,000 tons of this stuff per year and it, You understand you need to generate that much if something is mass-produced if you're going to sell it to people at a reasonable price and, and have everybody have a chance to get it then you have to mass produce these things so The only problem there is you're then going to mass produce the waste associated with it So this is the problem with the LeBlanc process Let's go back and look at the actual reactions for the LeBlanc process. If you see here, there is sulfuric acid and sodium chloride. This is ordinary table salt. These give you sodium sulfate and hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride, depending how you look at it. And that sulf sodium sulfate is what we're gonna take into the next step and combine it with calcium carbonate and carbon. So the carbon you can get just from coal and the calcium carbonate you can get from limestone. This is going to produce the sodium carbonate, which is what we want. Uh, look at the other things that are produced there. The calcium sulfide. Calcium sulfide, when you combine it with water, forms hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide has the unfortunate reality of smelling like rotten eggs. If you look at the previous reaction, one of the products there was hydrogen chloride. So hydrogen chloride would go into the air and combine with water to form the acid form. And this is one of the strong acids. So if you want to get an idea of what a LeBlanc factory was like, close your eyes and picture this. 
a blighted landscape surrounding a factory. Wafting plumes of smoke going into the air, of which part of this is hydrogen chloride, which combines with water to kill the surrounding vegetation around the factory. Out the side of the factory, you see a gigantic pile of solid waste that smells like rotten eggs. Understandably, people in the surrounding area were not very happy with the situation. And what you see here is society would start to grapple with how to handle these problems. Undoubtedly, it was important to make these products for the standard of living of the people. And for that, you needed to have mass production techniques. But these same mass production techniques were producing a lot of unwanted waste. What are we going to do with it? Well, people initially tried uh, legislation. They would put uh, penalties and taxes on things like that. And companies would respond by trying to find loopholes. They would um, you know, do their best to find that. But then inevitably they settle on, hey, maybe we can sell these waste streams. If you can make money from the waste stream, fantastic. This is actually a really good idea. Unfortunately, it just didn't always work out as well as you would like. But it did happen. I like how Kevin Dunn puts it in his book. Uh, Growing from scattered factories to immense complexes, soda manufacturers would, by the end of the 19th century, introduce such modern innovations as toxic waste dumps, water pollution, and acid rain. This pollution would create a climate of government regulation which would force manufacturers to find markets for former waste products. Eventually, these new chemicals would become even more profitable and you would have another round of industrial growth and the same process would repeat over again. So, society is grappling with what to do with this problem. You know, you don't want to stop production of these, um, these important products, uh, but you also don't want the bad stuff. What are we going to do here? Well, in order to figure out that, I want you to come back for the exciting conclusion of our story. But first, I want to leave you with something. Um, let's think about a tiny miniature factory that's around us everywhere. These tiny miniature factories are in cells, in the cells in your body, and also I want to focus on the cells in plants. The cells in plants can take sunlight, some minerals from the soil, carbon dioxide from the air, and a little bit of water, and they can make all of the things that they need from it. They have, they make thousands of different chemicals. What are the waste products from these little miniature factories inside of plants? The waste product is oxygen. We happen to breathe in oxygen. Do you see the wonderful little interconnected process here? There's a symbiotic interconnected relationship between plants and animals where we use the waste stream from their product. It's better than it sounds and they use the waste stream for us. We literally breathe out CO2, which they then use in the processes for their little miniature factories. It's a fantastic, wonderful process. Essentially, green chemistry is trying to copy the plant world and the animal world. It's an amazing process, and we are just trying to do our best to try and copy it. So come back next time and see the exciting conclusion of our discussion of green chemistry.